Good morning. Welcome to everyone here this morning. If you would, please rise with me this morning. Uh, we'll start with a scripture reading. I'm reading from Philippians 4, verse 4 this morning. And it begins, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Just a wonderful little passage to always remind ourselves to lift it up to the Lord. And let's continue our morning's worship by singing to the Lord. Thank you. Please. join with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning just ever worshipful of you, Lord. We thank you for your word and all that it contains, Lord. And as we open up your word today, Lord, we pray that your words would come forth, that it would mold us and change us to make us more like you, Lord. We pray your blessing upon today on the worship and on the word, Lord. We just give it to all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a moment to greet one another in the love of the Lord. Uh, just letting you know that next week, daylight savings time ends. So make a note to fall back to set your clocks back one hour for next Sunday, November 5th. Otherwise, you'll show up here an hour early and we'll find something for you to do. Give you a broom or mop or something. Uh, next Sunday also will be a communion Sunday morning. So we will be doing a communion on both Sunday morning services next Sunday. So please uh, make a note to join us for that as well. The next Sunday is a big Sunday. And the next Sunday night, we are going to be watching a film on the Protestant Reformation um, as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation by showing a short documentary and enjoying a question and answer with the filmmaker. So if you look in your calendars, October 31st should say Reformation Day, and uh, two days from now is the 500th anniversary of that. So we'll be watching a film on that. 
All right, high school, college, bonfire night. Grab dinner, s'mores, and jump in on ping pong at the Fall Flanstival Bonfire Night on Saturday, November 11th at Eli and Jessica Maxwell's home. The cost is just $5, and the deadline to sign up is November 8th. And I see there's a sign-up flyer out in the foyer, so all you college-age and high schoolers, now's the time to get ready for s'mores and some ping pong. Sounds like a good time. For additional details on ministries and upcoming events, check your bulletins or visit us online at our church website or our online community, The City. And let's stand as we continue in worship this morning. I pray that as we gather here today, Father, that the truth of your word would go deep into our hearts, Lord, that it would be life-changing, Father, and that those around us would see that change and be drawn to you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for your gift of um, life, Father, of this beautiful day where we get to gather and glorify you. Jesus, be with us today in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Right. 
to see 
as we continue our worship by receiving this morning's tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you ever thankful for uh, all the blessings you have so richly poured out upon us, Lord, and we would like to give back a portion of those. Please take these tithes and these offerings, Lord, and just multiply them and use them for the spreading of your word, the spreading of your gospel that it can go forth, Lord. We pray your blessing upon these. We thank you and just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
worship team. We haven't played that song in a while. It might be new to some of you. Um, I always think of, uh, what's that movie that plays the same tune? Mir it's a Wonderful Life, yes. So I kind of want to look up. And Way to go, Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, the song's been redeemed, and it, new words put to it, and uh, I, I love it. I love those words. Um, all glory be to Christ. So, Pastor Rob again is uh, missing this week, but uh, him and the group that went to Israel just arrived uh, back home, and uh, actually the, their bus pulled up here during first service, and so Pastor Rob stuck his head in and uh, said hello, and uh, I think they'd been up for 24 hours straight. Uh, so they're, uh, except I think there's someone here that was on the trip. Where is he? There he is. Robert made it back. <laughs> How are you feeling, Robert? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> okay, great. Well, don't don't <laughs> don't fall asleep because we're going to be talking about humility today. <laughs> Something you need to hear, apparently, and that's why you're here. <laughs> I got you, Robert. <laughs> but uh, Pastor Rob did send a video message for us, and so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at that. Wow, it just changed. In the background, just a spectacular view of the city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Behind me, you see two mosques, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock Mosque. But this is where the temple was in the time of Jesus. And here from the Mount of Olives is where he got on that donkey, on the foal of a donkey. And he rode down the Mount of Olives and crossed the Kidron Valley and up into Jerusalem and presented himself as king. They raised their palm branches, they put their clothes on the ground, and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be to God, who comes in the name of the Lord. And so, anyway, this is where it all happened. It's very exciting to be here. And when he comes again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in his second coming, he will come through that eastern gate and nothing will stop him. And that's an exciting day. Amen. All right. I heard that it was a great trip, huh, Robert? Yeah. Trip of a lifetime. Wonderful. So we're so happy for them. I, I missed them. Did, did you guys miss them? And, and I know they missed us, too. Uh, so I got lots of messages uh, over the last 12 days. And uh, so glad to have them back and that the, everybody was safe. No injuries, except Tim fell down the Coliseum steps, is what I heard. <laughs> but he's okay. <laughs> he's good. Let's stand together and let's open up our Bibles to First Peter chapter 4. And if you need a Bible, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will get one to you. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Last week we covered First uh, Peter three thirteen through chapter four verse six. So we'll pick it up in First Peter chapter four verse seven, and we'll just read the first couple of verses here. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for for love will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that you have here for us today. Lord, we pray that you would just do the work that you, uh, you promised to do, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that you will use your words and use them to minister to our, our hearts, Lord, and that they would change us. Lord, I pray that we would not leave the same people that we were when we came in, that we would be more like you through the teaching of your word. And Lord, we just lift this time up to you now. Pray that you would, be, you would be blessed and that you would be glorified in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So again, this morning we're picking up where we left off last week um, in Peter's letter uh, to the persecuted believers that have been dispersed. And I've entitled the sermon this morning, Our Conduct in Suffering, Part 2. And obviously last week was Our Conduct in Suffering, Part 1. Um, but today's message, uh, that's just really a title. There's a lot more in this section of Scripture than just uh, suffering for the persecuted believers. 
So we'll touch on several topics. Uh, Peter continues in this section by giving us some commands of our conduct in the midst of suffering. And really, the whole context of this letter is sent to persecuted believers who have been dispersed to foreign lands. In verse 7, he continues that, and he says, Be serious and be watchful in your prayers. So if we are really to believe that we are living in the last days, which I believe that we are, we ought to be giving ourselves up to prayer. You know, as Pastor Rob has said in the past, every generation before us thought that they were living in the last days. But do you realize that we are more right than that they were? I mean, we, were, we're, we are actually closer. And as we go, th- we've been going through the book of Revelations, and we see what is going to happen in the very final days, in the tribulation, we see things in our world and in our culture today that are really forming, and things are leading up to those events. Paul said in Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And Jesus was recorded by the, gospel writer, by the gospel writers as saying this about prayer. Matthew writes in chapter 26, verse 41, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mark chapter 13, verse 33 says, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Luke records Jesus as saying in Luke 21, 36, Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. So we are called as believers to watch. That means to give strict adherence to, give strict attention to, to be uh, attentive, to be ready. So Peter says that we're to be serious and we're to be watchful in our prayers. And the, that word serious is meaning to be sober, to be self-controlled. Watchful means to be collected uh, in, in our thinking, to, be, to, to watch out for. And so I'm to be serious and thoughtful about my prayer time. And if I'm serious about my time with God, I'm going to take my time with him. I'm going to give him my time. I'm going to sacrifice time out of my day to the Lord and not to be rushed and the time to just be quiet and to listen to him. I shouldn't allow my phone or other things to distract me. How many of us have sat there that time, that phone is there, and you hear bzz, bzz, and then you're you're distracted, and you pick that up. And the time that you are with the Lord, supposed to be communing with God, and I'll just send this quick text back to this person and send a silly emoji or something. You know, how guilty are we of that? I think these phones can be a great distraction in our culture today so that things should be turned off or put in another room altogether we devote our time to the Lord am I giving him that kind of devotion am I sitting still being serious being watchful being alert listening as I talk to him verse 8 says and above all things have fervent love for one another you know love for a Christian is to reign supremely in our lives because such great love has been given to us by our Savior. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that chapter is often known as, called the love chapter. And that verse there says, and now abide, abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is what? The greatest of those is love. And those are three great things, to have faith and to have hope and love, those are all great, but the greatest of them is love. And so as we become more serious in our prayers and are praying for others that God puts on our hearts, we will have that fervent love for them that he has. And that word fervent is an interesting word. It means to be stretched out or to have intent or an earnestness, a fervency. So it's not emotional or passionate like you would think. And Peter doesn't write, have a passionate love for one another, but a a fervent, a focus, an intentional love. And the word there for love is the Greek word agape. And that means to be affectionate or have goodwill or a benevolence towards someone. It's to be focused on another with the intent on blessing. So we are to have fervent love, not necessarily emotional love for one another, but 
often emotions do come uh, when we have expressed love for one another. But it's to be purposeful, and it's expressly others-focused. So that word fervent is only appears about seven times in the Bible. And here's, about, here's another three of them. In Romans 12, 11, it says that we are to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, 7 says we are to be fervent in mind, so fervent in our thinking. And James 5, 16 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then here we see it in 1 Peter. So as Christians, we're to be fervent in, our, in the spirit, fervent in mind, fervent in our prayer, and, and fervent in our, in our love for one another. So why fervency? Why a fervent, intense, uh, intentful, earnest love for one another? Well, love covers a multitude of sins, Peter tells us. It covers both the sins of the one loving and the sins of the one receiving the love. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers sins, all sins. Now, it's not that having love for one another, we turn a blind eye to sin. But as we pray for one another and love one another, we are able to forgive one another and focus chiefly and primarily on expressing love. I like the way a Bible commentator, Wayne Grudem, puts it. He says, where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even some large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. But where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion, every action is liable to misunderstanding, and conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delight. Puts it pretty well, doesn't it? Is there something or that someone in your life does that just bugs you? I know we all have them. <laughs> Maybe a friend of yours or your spouse that does something. Maybe your pastor. <laughs> you ever walk out of here saying, oh, he, he did that thing again, or he, he, he made that phrase again. I, 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 don't, I hate when he does that. <clears throat> I hate when he cries. I know you're talking about me if you say that. <laughs> so what do you do about those feelings? We all have them, right? We, we battle against this fleshly nature. Well, we bring them, first of all, to the Lord. And we pray for them. And we show them love. And then we see what God will do. And most often, God won't change the people that I'm praying for. But he'll change my heart and my attitudes for them as I pray for them. And it'll change my heart. And my love will cover, will supersede a multitude of sin. Verse 9 says, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So we are to serve one another without complaining. I'm to serve my family. I'm to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ without grumbling, without complaining, without muttering. So love will show itself in hospitality and serving one another. And often that hospitality is done in our homes. Christians should often open up their homes to others and do it without grumbling. You know, there's been several times over the past few years where our family has been invited over to someone's house after Sunday evening service or Sunday afternoon. And when I was preparing this, just thinking about those times, they're very memorable. I can remember going to Don and Jean Bothan's house four or five, or two or three years ago. Just just the time that we spent there was a blessing. Our own pastor and, and Tamara are very hospitable, opening up their home for many occasions. Um, many, many of you are, are show that hospital, hospitality, and these times of hospitality, said, are, they're memorable, and they're enjoyable, and they can bring a reprieve to an individual or a family who is sitting in another home, getting to know another family, and they're not in their own surroundings looking around at all the projects that they have to do in their own house, but they're just able to enjoy the, that, that company, and that's a blessing. For uh, a few years, we, we had um, a gal in our fellowship, Amanda Parker. Many of you know her. I don't see Amanda here today. But we'd, we'd have almost like a date with her once a month. She'd come over home, have a meal, watch a movie or play a game, and just spend time with her. And I know that was a blessing to her. It was a blessing to those who are doing the giving and doing the, the hosting. So I encourage you to do that. Now think about this. Peter is instructing 
these things to disperse Christians who are being persecuted. He's telling them, be hospitable. Have a fervent love for another. Stretch yourselves out for one another. Minister your gifts, we'll see in the next couple of verses. Minister your gifts to one another. So where is Peter, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he is writing this, telling us where to have our focus? It's not on ourselves, it's on others. So how does that kind of focus help me when I'm suffering? Well, what it does, it gets my eyes off my own self and my own misery and how God can use me still to bless others. And while that is happening, that is giving a testimony to the power of God in your life where people can watch and say, wow, that person, even though I know what they're going through, but they continue to serve God and serve him joyfully. Verse 10 says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So recognize that it's by God's grace that we have, each of us, have received a gift from him or gifts from him. Certainly, if you're a believer here today, you receive the gift of salvation. But each one has received a gift, Peter writes. So each of us have received gifts from God. Have you received yours? Have, I wonder if some of us have been given gifts that we have yet to open. Do you know what your gift or gifts are? Have you asked God to show you what they are? Whatever our gifts that the Lord has given to each of us, we are to be good stewards of them. What is a good steward? A steward is a manager or someone that's entrusted of the care of something. They take care of it. They use it properly. They use what is entrusted to him for the proper purpose. So how can you deal rightly with the gift if you don't know what that gift is? James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Our Father loves us, and he only gives us good gifts, and they come from him. You know, I have gifts that the Lord has given me. I have, a, I, I believe, a gift of writing, and I've used that gift to bless other people. Uh, several years ago, especially, uh, I would write poems for individuals in my life uh, on, a, on an event like a retirement or a, a birthday or or, or, or some reason. I even wrote a, a poem for my wife to propose to her. And so God, is, I, I've used that gift uh, just to, to bless other people. I believe he's given me the gift of being a pastor or a leader or, and, and a speaker. You know, this past uh, few weeks, a few weeks ago, we celebrated Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And I like what Jason suggested that uh, Pastor Rob and I do this year, different than uh, other years, is we've had uh, people pray for us and put their hands on us. This year we prayed for you. And I know it was, I didn't have a prepared prayer. Um, I just prayed how the, the Holy Spirit was leading me. And I believe the, the Holy Spirit put on my heart to pray for you, to recognize what the gifts are that God has given you and to use them. And it was very interesting. Uh, uh, within a couple days, we had a few people call the church and say, and I don't even know if they heard this prayer, but it doesn't matter. I know God heard it. Uh, but God put it on the heart for them to want to use the gifts that they have to minister to this body. And so what a, what a blessing uh, that is to do that. And then Peter, um, Peter gives a couple generic examples in verse 11. And it's not an exhaustive list. He says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we are to minister our gifts to one another and to bless one another with our gifts. And we're to do it in every way in which God supplies. So the way I interpret that is we don't want to get ahead of the Lord to do m beyond what he has supplied, where we end up subsidizing it in our own strength and then get burned out uh, by it. But we're to do it in a way so that he gets the glory, and that's where the glory belongs. Verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering, that when 
his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So we're not to be surprised when suffering and trials come, even the fiery ones. And Peter says, if we partake in his sufferings, that we will also partake of his glory and his joy. Remember the story of uh, Peter, when Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him, when Jesus was foretelling of his coming suffering on the cross in Mark chapter 8. And it says there, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So we are not to save, try to save ourselves from suffering. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And nor, as Peter tells us, are we to be surprised when it comes. Jesus said to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. So we should never deny the place that suffering has in us to build godliness in the Christian life. So what are these hardships? What are the sufferings that we face? Well, they can come in a variety of ways, right? Some of those ways are temptations or illnesses or lost jobs, broken relationships, and persecution for one's faith are all forms of hardship. And Christians should not be taken surprised when these things come. Jesus warned us. He said, in this world, you will have cake and ice cream every day. Did he say that? No, he did not. You're listening. Thank you. <laughs> he said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's a promise from God. But the good news he also gave us is that Jesus followed up with a warn. Um, a, follow up this warning with a word of encouragement. He said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And we also, in him, are overcomers as well. And we can endure these trials by his grace. Now listen to this verse, Hebrews 5, 8. Though he was a son, speaking of Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So if suffering was a suitable tool to teach Jesus in his humanity, how much more suitable a tool to teach his servants, those who follow him? Verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. <clears throat> you know, suffering for the name of Christ really is a blessing. Why? Because it shows that we are following Jesus. And that we suffer because we are identified with him. He says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, etc. So, in other words, don't suffer for doing, doing evil, for sinning. If you are, then you, just, you deserve that. But if we are walking in the Spirit, we won't be living in such a way that we are suffering for our sin. But we very well may suffer for doing good. So we need to remember, going back to verse 2 there, that we should no longer live the rest of this time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but we live for the will of God. <clears throat> but verse 16 there says, if you suffer as a Christian, 
don't be ashamed, but glorify God in this ma matter. So we don't glorify God for the suffering. We, 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 don't, we don't have to say, thank you, God, for the suffering is wonderful. No, but we can glorify him in it. And we can rejoice in it, knowing what he will accomplish in us and through us uh, with the suffering. Now, in verse 16, we see the word Christian. I think we all know that a Christian is a Christ follower, a follower of Jesus. Now, Jesus' first disciples uh, were followers, were first known as disciples. They also were called believers. They were also called the Lord's disciples or those who belong to the way before they were known as Christians. And we first see them called Christians in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. It says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so this is the first of three places in the New Testament where the followers of Jesus are named Christians. The second place we see it is in Acts again, in chapter 26, verse 28, where King Agrippa uh, was listening to Paul give a testimony of Jesus Christ. And Agrippa told Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. So this shows us that between Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter tw 26, that the word Christian had become a popularized name for followers of Jesus. And the third place, of course, is here in 1 Peter 4, verse 16. And the idea here is that some are suffering because they are identified as Christians, if you suffer as a Christian. So this shows us that the name had become widely used, so much so that uh, you could be persecuted for being numbered as a Christian. And verse 17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let us who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So Peter is saying that now is the time for God's judgment, his fiery trial to try us, and it's for the house of God. It's for the believer. The ungodly are, are those who do not obey the gospel, and they will have their fire later. That will be their end. Now, this is not a judgment for the Christian that goes on to, for damnation. Uh, this is a judgment, more of a purifying fire. For the Christian, the issue of punishment was settled once and for all at the cross, where Jesus endured the punishment uh, for the Christian that we could never face from God. So it, if it begins with us first, Peter says, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? So the, the application is clear here. If this is what God's children experience, the suffering and the, the trials here on earth, what will become of those who have made themselves his enemies? How can they ever hope to stand before the judgment and wrath of God? You know, as Christians, we can rejoice um, that the sufferings that we face in this life are the worst that we will ever face throughout all eternity. But those who reject Christ have seen the best life that they will ever have on this earth, and the worst is yet to come. Peter says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved. So what Peter is saying is that the salvation of the righteous does not come without difficulty. This should make us pause if we ourselves or, or if others seem to have w sort of an easy salvation. Not that our sa salvation is difficult in the sense that we need to earn it or find a way to deserve it. Salvation, to be sure, is a free gift of Jesus Christ. It's available to all. Yet our salvation is hard in that being a disciple of Jesus Christ challenges us and it demands that we cast away our idols and our sins. Real discipleship, genuinely following after Jesus Christ, is often a hard thing. And as we talked about it last week, it's, it's a narrow path. And we looked at that in comparison to the broad road that leads to destruction and how I envision that narrow path going right up the middle of that 
broad path, and we're going to bump into people. We're going to bump, ha- have difficulty and, and trial. It's going to be a, a difficult path, and it is. So we understand why Peter quotes this passage from Proverbs where the righteous one is scarcely saved. In verse 19, he says, Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. You know, when we commit our lives, we commit our souls to God. When we, as chapter 3, verse 13 says, When we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, where he reigns supreme, we place our souls in a very safe place. God is a faithful creator, and we can give ourselves to him like, like a cl- lump of clay in a potter's hands. He is a faithful creator. And so much of the agony that we put ourselves through in times of trial and suffering has to do with our disregard or forgetfulness of God's faithfulness. Have you not remembered that God is faithful? Or of his place as creator. He is a sovereign creator. And he has the right to do with us whatever he pleases. Yet he is faithful and he will only do what is ultimately the best for us. And he knows what is best for us. So just as there's no better place for a lump of clay to be sitting on a potter's wheel ready to be created by a master creator, so is the Christian in no better place than being the hands of a faithful creator. The scripture tells us that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5. Peter writes, The elders who are among you, I exhort, I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So Peter exhorts the elders among the Christians that would be reading this letter. And he says in verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So God wants the elders of his church, uh, the elders of his flocks, to serve willingly, not by compulsion, not by force. And I could tell you that the elders of this church um, have been long prayed for before Pastor Rob even approaches that man to to see if the Lord has called them to, to be an elder in this body. And it's not by force. Not once has Pastor Rob approached him and said, um, you're going to be an elder. You've been around here long enough, it's time for you to be an elder. No, it's, it's done with much prayer, and it's asked, and, and that, that person then prays about it. Second Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1 address the qualifications of an elder. And one of the things that it says is, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And so that desire has to be placed by the Lord God himself to that man to, to be an elder of a church. Not because there's no one else to do the work or a pastor demands that you do it, but God wants men to heed the call of eldership willingly, voluntarily, because he has given you the desire to serve in that capacity. So let me address you men. We don't have any other elders here right now, but the Lord may call you one day to be an elder. Don't discount that. I was a Christian for 20 years. I discounted that for 20 years that I could ever be an elder or a pastor. Until one day, and I can tell you the very spot I was standing in in the Fellowship Hall on Orange Avenue, where the Lord just stopped me dead in the tracks and said, I'm calling you to, to be a pastor. And when I received that call, I couldn't believe my response was, yes, Lord, I want to. He had put that desire and the call really at the same time. So men, don't discount that. Seek the Lord, and he may be preparing you now, and you don't even know it, that he is preparing you for that role. So how are we to serve as an elder? Uh, Well, we're to shepherd. 
primary responsibilities Jesus gave them to Peter. He said to feed the sheep. Jesus told this to Peter in, in John chapter 21. So feeding the sheep is doing what I'm doing right now. It's opening up God's word, teaching it, reading it. 1 Timothy chapter 3, another qualification of an elder is able to teach. Doesn't mean you have to be gifted or the most eloquent speaker, just able, that you are able and, and, and willing to, to teach. And secondly, to tend the sheep. Tending is to pr protect, to guide and nurture and care for the sheep. And Peter continues in verse 3, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the translation of uh, that phrase, those entrusted to you, it's really God's heritage. So it's like God is saying, Th this is my heritage, this flock of mine. They have, they have my name. These, these are Christians. So the idea here um, that God has signed various portions of his precious possession, the flock of God, to the personal care of elders and pastors. That he's entrusted the responsibility of the spiritual care of certain groups of individuals to particular shepherds. So it's almost like we're made for each other. <laughs> the, the, the pastors, the, uh, the elders of, of, of God, he selected us and he selected you, and he's selected us for one another. And there's a certain reward for those shepherds. It's a crown of glory that does not fade away, and we get it from the chief shepherd. That's who we work for as pastors and elders. We are not hirelings uh, for the sheep uh, or hirelings by the sheep, and some congregations will do that. They'll, they'll, they'll decide who, who gets to be their pastor. I don't see that happening. I see God calling um, men to to be to the eldership and the crowns are not only for shepherds but everyone who was faithful to Jesus and does what he has called them to do and we see that in Revelation 2 verse 10 where it says be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life verse 5 likewise you younger people Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So Peter here addresses the younger people. He says, submit yourselves to your elders. In verse 5, he says, for all of us to be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. The phrase to be clothed re refers to a a slave putting on an apron before serving, much like Jesus did before washing the disciples' feet when he girded himself. There's many marks of humility, but some of them are, uh, are, are these. The willingness to perform the lowest, lowliest, lowest and littlest services for Jesus' sake and for the sake of others. Also an awareness of our own inability to do anything apart from God. Thirdly, the willingness to be ignored of men. And fourthly, not so much like a self-hating or self-deprecation, but more about like a self-forgetfulness and being truly other-centered instead of self-focused. I wanted to share a story with you. Again, it's a uh, about my son Sam, he 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 gives gives me lots of sermon fodder, uh, being a good young man that he is. Um, but he was a couple of years ago when he was probably about sixteen. He was asked to be part of a competition of uh, uh, they were forming f uh, the, the Modesto Chamber of Commerce was forming four groups of uh, web designers and graphic designers, um, and they were groups of like three or four. And most they were all professionals, but they were short on graphic designers. So Sam had taken a graphic design class at Modesto Junior College, 
And so the people who were forming this called the junior college and asked if they knew of any graphic designers, you know, former students or, or uh, existing students. And so th that designer gave them Sam's name. And so he got this email out of the blue saying, we'd like to see if you'd be interested in doing this. Can you send us some samples of the work? Anyway, they selected him. So he got to be part of this competition. And these, these teams were, were formed um, to build a web page or a uh, you know, website or, or an application for, for a phone uh, for a nonprofit. So each of the four teams was paired with a nonprofit organization, and it was a one-day thing, like 14 hours, from 7 in the morning till like 8 at night or something like that. So I dropped Sam off, picked him up the, uh, at night, and my son was a sheltered homeschool kid his whole life, right? So he, d he didn't know how good he was <laughs> at this gift that God had given him. Um, and he did very well. Um, and when I got there, you know, people were just talking to me about him. And I said, oh, well, great, He's, he did a good job. And anyway, he performed really well. And I'm telling you a lot of stuff that I don't need to tell you, but <laughs> just to get to, to a point. Um, but anyway, he did, he did really well. He was recognized um, for, for, for doing something well. And he was blessed by uh, the leader of his group was a, a man who owns a web development company, and he's a Christian. And, and that, towards the end of the day, this man, I could see he saw Sam getting a lot of accolades. And uh, before we left, uh, he said, hey, Sam, stay humble. And I said, oh, thank you for saying that. Because <laughs> I'm glad somebody else was saying that to him other than me, because that's been a message to my children as they've kind of gone off uh, in, out into the world and on their own, is to remain humble. It's very important for a young person to get that message, to stay humble, to not looking at you on purpose, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am. <laughs> but it's so important. Pride can, especially when we have success, pride can just rise up and then we think that we're all that and we're not all that. We want to remain humble. Why do we want to remain humble? Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I'm all for God's grace. Humility is essential in our relationship with God. If we want to walk in God's grace, in his unmerited favor, then we must lay aside our pride and remain humble. And not only to him, but to one another. We show our humility towards one another because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So if God has you in a humble place at this present time, we must submit to God's plan. He knows the due time to exalt us, though we often think that we know that time better than others, don't we? Or better than God does. Verse 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And true humility is shown in our ability to cast our care upon God because he cares for us. And it's pride that keeps us <coughs> it's pride that keeps us from bringing our request to a loving father and take things into our own worry and the things that God has promised to take care of. I love Psalm chapter 8 verse 4 says, "What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him?" It's almost like David, the psalmist, is saying, I can't believe that you care for me, but I know that you do. And verse 8 says, Your adversary, the devil, walks about. Peter exhorts us to remain clear-headed, to be sober and watchful, to be vigilant, because Satan has not yet been bound, as he will be in the thousand years, as Re Revelation 20 says he will be. And at the present time, the devil walks about. Though he is a finite being, he can't be in more, one place, more than one place at a time, his effort and his energy and his associates, the, the demons, they enable him to extend his influence all over the world and in every arena of life. And we see the results of that in our world today, don't we? The 
again in verse 8, it says like a roaring lion. And so for, for Christians, Satan is like a lion who may roar, but he has been defanged at the cross. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, having disarmed principalities, though Satan's been disarmed, and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. But he still, the sound of his roar, or his deceptive lies, still have, are, are potent, and he has the power to, to rob Christians of, of our effectiveness. Verse 9 says, resist him, steadfast in the faith. So this is spiritual warfare, and the best way to combat spiritual warfare is to remain steadfast and resistant. And as we are steadfast in our faith, we resist the devil's lies and the threats and his intimidation. Peter says, knowing that the same sufferings that you experience are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So we can take comfort that we are not alone in our suffering. We have brothers and sisters all around this world that are suffering. And they have fought and they are fighting the same battles. So to summarize what God is teaching us today, number one, in these, these probable last days, be serious and be watchful in your prayers. Number two, show a fervent love for one another. Number three, be hospitable. Invite somebody to your home. Number four, open and use the gifts that the Father has given you and be good stewards of them. Use them for the proper use that God has given them to you. Number five, expect fiery trials, but rejoice of what God can do through them all. Number six, commit your soul to God in doing good as to a faithful creator. And number seven, suffering is a suitable tool for us to learn obedience. And as a side note to that one, you know, many years ago, I've been a Christian for 26 years. My early days, I remember fellowshipping with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Often we'd have, we'd ask one another, what is the Lord teaching you right now? That's a great question. I think that, that question has kind of fallen away, and we don't ask that with each other. What, or, what are you learning through the trial that you're going through? What is God trying to teach you? And God does intend to teach us through those, those trials and that suffering. And then lastly, live in humility, remembering that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and let's pray. Father, you are a good, good God. Thank you, Lord, for this section of your word that has a lot in it, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would use um, your word in every heart here, that you would apply what needs to be applied, Father. And I, Lord, I pray that there is anything that was not of you that was spoken today, that that would be forgotten and that everything that was of you would be used for your glory and for effectiveness in our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name.